Thank you very much. As we were preparing this uh, panel, it, it, we sort of said, how can we get people to address the difficulties? And, and I have to say that the, the, what came to my mind was considerably different than what came to the three speakers' minds when they did this. And so I'm going to focus on a relatively narrow question, which might be less interesting, actually. But on the other hand, I, uh, I've been struck by how even today, even in all of the discussions we've had, we've had very, very, very few people actually link, except in the most general way, to concepts of early development, concepts of brain science, and policy and interventions. And it's not that they need to, necessarily. There's lots of huge work, and I'm not even sure you need to know a mechanism for the way neuroscience relates to, for example, poverty, or for example, interventions in developing countries. But I decided to ask the question anyway, and I've entitled this Crossing the Translation Bridge, How Long a Crossing Will It Be? And my guess is that it's going to be a hell of a lot longer than we'd like to think, despite the incredible advances that uh, we're hearing about uh, during this meeting. And so this is wonderful to see that everybody is convinced. This is a Jim Heckman slide that I actually got from Fraser, so I thought it was appropriate to start the talk with it uh, via Clyde. And as you all know, he's argued that the investment is in, in uh, changing uh, development is not the same as in the R line across, uh, across the bottom, but it's much, much more effective if it's early and you get much greater return on investment. So that concentration is neat. Then there's a wonderful series of, of uh, experiments that Steve Sumi has done <coughs> out of his Poolsville uh, 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 colony of rhesus macaque monkeys. And uh, you'll hear more about this tomorrow. But it's based on, uh, it shows the significant effects of early intervention, uh, sorry, early parenting uh, differences uh, by comparing parent-reared and peer-reared rhesus monkeys. And uh, it, it is stunning about how that interaction goes across so many domains. And these are only two, which I've used in talks, thanks to Steve's offering them to me. The uh, ability to orient differently on a Brazelton rhesus exam, depending on whether you are reared as a nursery reared or a mother reared monkey, uh, rhesus macaque, uh, interacting with whether you had long, short, or, <coughs> or combined alleles uh, for the serotonin. Uh, promoter in, uh, inhibitor. And then the rhesus alcohol consumption also showing that, it, uh, that the differences uh, in rearing interact to have considerably different patterns uh, with the uh, serotonin promoter region uh, as well. And these uh, all show very, very similar things, reinforcing the importance of the early intervention, uh, early parenting experiences or early infancy experiences. So there's tons and tons of data that's been said many times today. And then there's all this wonderful stuff that's come out of Michael's lab. And I thank Michael for the next three slides, which I borrowed, which he showed you earlier, uh, about the importance of parental care leading to differences in DNA, gene expression, and phenotype. And uh, based on this, what is really key about this for me, and, uh, and maybe uh, for the, the long bridge that I'm going to suggest, is that this is all normative distribution. This isn't bad mothers and good mothers. This is all within the normal distribution of the percent time spent licking and grooming. And that has been such a key uh, uh, parental caregiving act. And it's interesting that it is often described as maternal licking and grooming, but it's also often described as maternal care. Now, maternal care is interesting because it's not just looking and grooming, although it's certainly looking and grooming in the rats. But the argument is that this has a mechanism by which it gets translated into these interesting outcomes uh, and changes the uh, the structure and function of DNA via this methylation, these methylation markers on uh, CPG islands. And of course, these are very tissue-specific effects, as Michael pointed out today. Uh, and these uh, differences have been shown now time and again in that remarkable <laughs> series exper of experiments that come out of his lab. So this has been happening for at least a decade. And uh, this book is by one of my favorite authors, authors Mel Connor, came out in 2010. My, uh, 
Uh, Mel is a very erudite and wonderful broad thinker, and he has done two or three reviews of this kind of literature now. This one uh, I described as an erudite, wide-ranging, systematic, cross-disciplinary, synthetic review of the intricacies of development. And if you go to the index, the word epigenics appears, but it hardly ever comes up in the book. Just barely is it is it a part of this story, and this is a about a 900-page book, so there's lots of room uh, to have a discussion on this. Now, what is the difference between what is described in this book? Maybe Mel's just dumb and he's not up to date, or maybe uh, uh, Michael's story hasn't been around long enough yet, and there's a lag time. I'm not exactly sure, but the interesting thing is uh, that it's not there, or at least only barely. So why is epigenetics only barely mentioned? And will epigenetics become the, or at least a, major storyline in future Connor-like books? And what are the challenges to getting there? So uh, as, a, as a pediatrician interested in early caregiver-infant interaction, um, it uh, occurred to me and Tom and a few other people that there might be an analog, and I shouldn't say the analog, but a human analog, to licking and grooming in humans. But are we going to be able to make that cross-species leap? Here is a picture of a Kung mother and her infant. Jared uh, quoted a lot about Mel's studies last night and his descriptions of, of early infant caregiver interactions in the Kung San. And <clears throat> this is a, one of my favorite pictures because it illustrates this wonderful en face interrelationship between the mothers and their infants. Of course, you get that in every culture uh, in the world uh, and every mother-human-infant pair. And in that interaction, the mother is making demands of the infant and the infant is making demands of the the mother, and there's this constant iterative process of going back and forth between the two of them, which is a very, very completely universal and basic experience of mother-infant interaction. <clears throat> and of course, the, mother, the, the licking and grooming is one of those in, in rats, but what could it be in that interaction that has anything similar to do uh, with infant development. And Tom and I, this is mostly Tom, <laughs> came up with this uh, acronym called the C-cubed care sequence uh, that suggested that there's a whole bunch of iterative, everyday, normative things that can range widely uh, from mother, amongst mother-infant pairs, including cleaning, bathing, caring, changing diapers, attending, and reading and expressing uh, various emotions and talking, as in Janet's talk as well. So we would have loved to have done a Michael Meany study for each of these or all of them together, but that's an incredibly impressive demand. So we actually started by looking at just mother-infant contact, and we happen to have a great database uh, to do this on. This was, these were diary studies of over a thousand mother-infant pairs uh, from the, what we call the Parents Helping Infants Study, and guess what? It has a remarkable, normative, uh, within uh, within species <laughs> uh, distribution, very similar to licking and grooming. Uh, this is just the amount of contact time between mothers and infants, and overall, that's nine in our society in lower uh, lower Vancouver. That's uh, nine hours and seven minutes on average. But if you do the same split that Michael did with the percent licking and grooming, we get a remarkable distributive split. So in the low body contact, its uh, average is six hours and 14 minutes, and the high body contact it averages 12 hours, and so there's between the two groups, there's a six hour difference from the low to the high body contact group. And we thought, well, let's have a wing and a prayer and see whether or not this contact has anything to do uh, with methylation patterns uh, that uh, have been suggested as being key uh, as a mechanism uh, to uh, help explain uh, some of those differences in terms of outcomes. So we have embarked on a study in which we're looking at methylation markers uh, with the help of Michael Colborn and Wendy Robinson uh, uh, in these tales of, the, of this uh, group around uh, mother-infant contact. So I'm not going to be able to tell you the answer today because <laughs> even though the data has been collected, it's been uh, mostly run and is being analyzed. But it did strike me as, as when we've 
launched on this study, and it's now been going for two or three years, that it raises all kinds of questions, and we had absolutely no idea, I think, at the beginning about how difficult this would be. And so my contribution to this panel discussion is just to mention some. Some of them are going to be obvious to anybody in the audience who's done anything like this before, and some of them are not specific to trying to understand whether we can go uh, to the human model from this exciting work that's been done by Michael and his colleagues. One is the leap from non-human to human species. The second is the issue of developmental timing. We had an interesting uh, 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 talk on that earlier today as well. One is the specificity of the epigenetic mechanism, the problem of peripheral biomarkers and what they mean, the issue of statistical degrees of freedom, and what phenomena are we uh, are we actually measuring here, and are they nonlinear phenomena, and what might that mean? And the concept of environmental epigenetics, which is a term that Michael didn't use in his talk today, but he talked about, <laughs> but with another author, colleague of his, uh, they specifically have a paper on environmental genetics talking about this, and I just want to mention that. So if we look at uh, the leap from non-human to human species in one of Michael's colleagues' papers, called you et al. in 2011, they make the point that parental signaling will vary in a species-specific matter, and that makes all kinds of sense and is almost self-evident. Uh, the question is, <clears throat> does it translate to the species of humans? And in this paper by McGowan and Michael and others in 2009, they reported that suicide victims with a history of child abuse compared to suicide victims without a history of child abuse and controls manifested epigenetic differences, increased cytosine methylation in the hippocampal neuron-specific exon 17 glucocorticoid receptor promoter, and they had decreased glucocorticoid receptor mRNA and decreased NGFI a transcription factor binding. Exactly exactly the kind of things in the analog uh, areas in the rat brain, and argued that these findings translate previous results from rats to humans and suggest a common effect of parental care on epigenetic regulation of hippocampal glucocorticoid receptor expression. These, though, were suicide victims. Parental care translated as suicide victims is a, and with child abuse is a pretty unique group and it's a pretty heavy thing. It's not an everyday thing. So is parental contact time going to have anything to do with this? Does it take that big an insult in order to do it? Open question and, uh, and certainly uh, something uh, that makes us pause. Secondly, developmental timing. This, of course, is a classic challenge when you're going from one species to another. In the rat mother variations in licking and grooming, I think Michael made the point today, and uh, is that, that we're talking about that difference in the first week of life. We had measures on uh, mother-infant contact during the sixth week of life. Is that too soon or is that too late? Is it, an, is it the right time or the wrong time? We absolutely don't know whether or not, A, the, uh, the mother-infant contact time is a relevant parameter, and secondly, whether developmentally we're looking at the right time. Specificity of the epigenetic mechanism, the NGFIA increases in glucocorticoid receptor expression uh, in the hippocampal neurons through the exon 17 promoter has been absolutely at the key center to uh, most or all, maybe all of Michael's papers. Is this the only mechanism or is there or are there more mechanisms and are those mechanisms more general or arguably even less general? Peripheral biomarkers, you can all imagine that especially in infants and children, samples that break the skin are significantly more challenging, both pragmatically and ethically. So how are we going to get to do the analog studies in children and infants uh, that need the kind of uh, the samples that we need in order to be able to nail this down? And do epigenetic markers on buccal swabs, which is accessible to us and which we have taken, reflect anything, and if so, what, in the central nervous system? The wonderful slide by uh, Brian Kolb this morning uh, would suggest that there's a, it's a very, very big leap to go from something peripheral to something central. Even, even within the brain, they're significantly different. Statistical degrees of freedom comes up. The current Illumina arrays samples that we're using, uh, sample over 450,000 sites. Will 1, 2, 10, or even 20 more methylated sites be drowned out in such an array, especially after you add the false detection rate algorithms and reject can we possibly reject potentially significant signals from that? This is unbelievable how the technology has changed the challenge. 
Uh, Nonlinear phenomena, just raising the question, this is a much bigger talk, but are the phenomena that we are describing at many levels of description, and this includes degrees of methylation, uh, gene networks, neural networks, brain regions, fear responses, stress responses, every phenomenon that we've talked about today, are, including developmental transitions, are they best assessed as linear or nonlinear dynamic systems? And most of the talks today have assumed that they're linear, and just to illustrate that with developmental transitions, Transitions. A linear transition is one that has a single value, if you like, mathematically of, uh, where's my thing here, of, on everything on the x-axis has a single value on the y-axis, but in developmental transitions that are nonlinear, it doesn't mean that they've got curved, this isn't curvilinear, we're talking about nonlinear, that you can have values on the y-axis that have one, two, or more values on the x-axis. And what that means, among other things, is that while you can make predictions if they're linearly related phenomena, in those areas where there's more than one value, you cannot make predictions, or at least not make the same kind of predictions. So this is a pr pretty significant basic assumption when we're looking at this. And finally, environmental epigenetics hypothesis by Calgi and Michael and others. I really thought this paper was great, Michael, because if we'd thought about it earlier, we might have changed what we were looking at, too, in the human analog study. But uh, the hypothesis is that if parental effects enhance the match between the phenotype of the offspring and the demands of the environment, so that there's quality of the environment, including stress, phenotype, and developmental outcomes, and that this is mediated by a parental signal, as Michael is arguing, that the nature of the parental signal that we should be studying should have be systematically associated with the quality of the prevailing environment and with a specific developmental outcome, and Michael gave a good example of that in his talk. Uh, so for example, if you put stress here and that goes up, uh, Michael pointed out that the licking and grooming goes down, resulting in an increase in the CRF, uh, hypothalamic CRF mRNA, and an increase in the uh, response <coughs> of the HPA system to developmental outcomes. So it is a very interesting question about whether we can nail down what this parental signal is in humans that might give us a chance to make the transition to humans. So in summary, the pace and the advancement of knowledge and the promise concerning epigenetic mechanisms underlying gene-environment interactions has been extraordinary, but I think crossing the translation bridge may yet prove to be a much longer journey uh, than we would wish. Thanks very much. <laughs>